Welcome to Pediatric Abusive Head Trauma Training, provided to you by the Cabinet for Health and Family Services. The objectives for today are to review the statistics of abusive head trauma, to define and describe abusive head trauma and its associated injuries, to describe the anatomy of the infant's head and brain, to understand the medical evaluation and follow-up of a child with abusive head trauma. To understand the range of outcomes for victims of abusive head trauma, and to discuss both the risk factors and prevention strategies of abusive head trauma. In 2010, House Bill 285 was passed in Kentucky. It is a piece of legislation that mandates or recommends education for various groups of individuals in Kentucky who work with or care for young children. It provides information to assist in recognizing early signs of maltreatment, which can prevent the escalation to pediatric abusive head trauma. It also provides caregivers with tools for dealing with a crying infant, the most common trigger for abusive head trauma. Prior to 2009, pediatric abusive head trauma was known as as by many other names. The most common was that of shaken baby syndrome. But in 2008, the medical community, the American Academy of Pediatrics, and the judicial system came together to better define the event of pediatric abusive head trauma, both medically and uh, legally. So since 2009, we have referred to this uh, injury as pediatric abusive head trauma. Pediatric abusive head trauma is the most common cause of disability and death in child physical abuse. It really makes sense because if you look at an inflicted, say, broken bone, that bone will heal. Now, that is a horrible thing to happen to a child, but that bone will heal, and it is not life-threatening. But when a child is injured in the head, near the brain, and there is brain involvement, then the chance of disability or death increases. So when we look at who are the children that our abusive head trauma is inflicted upon, it is our young children, our children one year of age or younger. Now, older children can be victims, but we don't see that as often. It is also the most common cause of death from brain injury in children less than one year of age. It is very rare for a child to die from or to be permanently disabled from maltreatment the first time they are abused or neglected. Child abuse escalates in severity and in frequency. So if we can understand the early signs of child abuse, we can intervene before it escalates to uh, a level that can result in disability or death. As you can see from these statistics, Kentucky has a lot of work to do. Our state has 30 to 40 deaths per year. These are deaths of children at the hands of their caregivers, with another 30 to 50 near deaths each year also of children at the hands of their caregivers. What is abusive head trauma? Pediatric abusive head trauma is a global brain injury caused by rotational and angular forces. It involves shaking, impact, or both. It includes subdural hematomas, retinal hemorrhage, bruising, and fractures. 
but it's the injury to the brain itself that causes the death or disability. Abusive head trauma is often triggered by crying. And again, it is not typically a one-time event. When looking at pediatric abusive head trauma, we have to think about rotational forces that make the brain turn on its axis, causing a shearing injury. When the child is shaken from side to side and around, the whole brain inside the skull is rotating. With rotation, the brain gets different movement of structures in areas of the brain. For example, the outer cortex moves more than the brain stem. This is the mechanism when uh, the perpetrator uh, grasps the child around their rib cage and the, and the child is shaking violently. The head whips back and forth. 25 to 50% of patients who have pediatric abusive head trauma have external evidence of the trauma, bruising, something that we can see uh, on the outside. But that means that 50 to 75% of children injured this way have no external sign. This picture shows the anatomy of the brain. You can see where the bridging vein connects to the scalp, the skull, and dura mater. During rotation of the brain, this vein becomes ripped apart from the brain, which causes bleeding inside of the vein. Again, we see from this illustration that the motion of the child's head causes the rotation of the brain stretching the bridging vessel to the point that it will tear. Subdural hemorrhage results from blood filling in the cavity after the tear. Another picture that shows the subdural hemorrhage. How does shaking a baby cause injury? During the shaking event, bridging veins can stretch, rupture, or break, and bleed, leading to subdural bleeding, also known as a subdural hematoma. Brain tissue is distorted and stretched during the shaking impact, causing damage to nerve cells and brain tissue. This can be either temporary damage or permanent damage. Why is the infant at such high risk? Unlike adults who have lots of nooks and crannies that hold our brain in place, the inside of the infant's skull is smoother, so the brain has the ability to move within there much greater than, than adults. There's more space between the outside of the brain and the inside of the skull. Children's brains grow more the first year of life than it does all of the rest of their life combined. So this space is necessary for that rapidly growing brain. Infants have relatively large heads compared to their body and their neck muscles are very weak. So they have no ability to counter the shaking there's not as much myelin around the individual nerve cells. Myelin is a product that is produced, and it usually takes until the child's about three years old for myelination to be complete. Uh, but it is a substance that uh, covers the ends of the nerve cells that helps protect them. And infants' brains are much more fragile 
than adults' brains. They're 25% more water in their brains, which makes them very soft. What doesn't cause abusive head trauma? We know that certain things do not cause this type of injury. Short falls, like a child falling from a couch or a bed, bouncing a child on your knee, rough play between a toddler and an adult, or between young toddlers. Immunizations cannot cause these types of injuries. Vitamin C or D deficiency, birth trauma, toddlers and pets. With regard to the birth trauma, we know that some babies are born with characteristics that might be similar to abusive head trauma, but they usually resolve within four to six weeks and they're not prominent. Also regarding rough play, the children that are typically at high risk for abusive head trauma injuries are, are under age one. And this is not a time when children would engage in rough play due to their limited mobility. According to the American Academy of Pediatrics, the act of shaken leading to shaken baby syndrome or now as it's known, pediatric abusive head trauma, is so violent that individuals observing it would recognize it is dangerous and likely to kill the child. Additional injuries. If impact is involved, we may see things like skull fractures, scalp bruises, or scalp swelling, but not necessarily. In other words, the absence of evidence of impact does not mean impact didn't occur. We may also see associated injuries such as the retinal hemorrhages, the bleeding in the back of the eye, skin injuries like bruises, bone injuries, fractures, or even abdominal organ injuries. Rib fractures. Posterior rib fractures are caused by violent squeezing of the chest. As you can see in this diagram, when the chest is squeezed and the back is unsupported, the ribs actually bend over the sides of the backbone and break. We know that this is highly specific for physical child abuse. Other possible uh, associated injuries are, as I said before, the bleeding in the backs of the eyes, those rib fractures, but other fractures as well, bruising, sometimes we can see the actual fingerprint marks, and internal abdominal Injury. Sometimes we will see abdominal injuries with our children, in our children that have pediatric abusive head trauma, or we may see nothing. Important key issues. Infants with abusive head injury may look completely normal. They may look uninjured from the outside. The signs and symptoms may be vague and easily mistaken for a more benign problem. Therefore, abusive head trauma is sometimes missed or misdiagnosed by medical professionals. The 10-4 bruising rule. Any bruising of the torso, ears, or neck in a child four years of age or younger or any bruising anywhere on a child who is four months of age or younger should all be concerns. The torso includes bottom of the neck to the top of the legs, front and back. In this picture, 
you can see that this three-year-old was struck with a wooden paddle and you can see the bruises on his torso. In the second photograph, you can see that the ear is bruised. Now bruising anywhere on the ear is uh, what we look for. In this particular case, this six month old baby was kicked in the head and has bleeding on the inside of the skull from the impact in addition to what you see externally. Neck bruising in the bottom picture is in a four month old little boy who was violently shaken. Notice the bruises under his chin and on his chest. He survived but has severe developmental issues. Torso. The baby on the left was nine months old when she was brought into the emergency room by her mother with unexplained bruising after being left alone with mom's boyfriend. The baby presented happy and playful with only that small bruise. Mom said, however, she had noticed a difference in the child's behavior, which is why she brought the child to the emergency room. It was found that the child had suffered a tear in her liver from a fisted blow inflicted by the boyfriend. The infant to the far right, the baby was discovered in his crib after a domestic violence call went out to the police. Police and DCBS responded. Luckily, the social worker conducted a skin check and discovered the bruising on the belly. The child suffered from injuries to his liver and pancreas, along with broken bones and a head injuries. The bruises on the torso were the main clue. Ear bruising. Let's look at the upper left photo and we see bruising of an ear from pinching. In the upper right we see bruising on an ear of a child from the child being kicked in the ear. And then let's look at neck bruising. When we look at the photograph on the left hand side, what we see is a, a child that is a victim of pediatric abusive head trauma. When the child is shaken so violently and the head whips back and forth, the, we find bruising along the jawline and along the chest as well. In the photo on the right, we see a child who was um, taken to the doctor for a well baby visit. And when the doctor asked about the injuries there uh, on the child's ear and surrounding area, the mom said it was because he fell asleep on a Lego. The doc, of course, did not believe that was the cause of the injury and contacted DCBS. During the investigation, it was found that the dad had actually strangled the child during the night because the child woke him up. Any bruising anywhere on a child four months of age or younger is a concern. These are non-mobile infants who are not falling, not getting in, into toys and injuring themselves. Therefore, they should not have bruising on their bodies. In the picture on the left, 
the child went in for a well baby exam. Bruises were noted during the exam. The parents were asked, and their response was, he wiggles a lot during diaper change. The doctor understood the significance of bruising and had an abuse workup done. The baby was found to have multiple healing fractures and had an injury to the liver. Abuse had been happening over an extended period of time since some of the injuries were already healing. The only clue was the bruises on the abdomen. This particular child does have a herniated belly button that has no significance to the case. Look at those two small bruises under the belly button. That was the doctor's only clue that abuse had occurred. The child in the picture to the right has almost an identical story. And the only sign was the bruise on the back of the leg. Bruising in infants less than six months. Bruising is extremely rare in infants less than six months of age and uncommon in preambulatory infants. In one study, only two of 366 children, 0.6%, younger than six months, had bruises at a well child exam. Bruising in infants is a significant indicator of abuse and must be medically evaluated. Bruising is the most overlooked sign of child abuse. What is normal? Normal accidental bruising in toddlers and older children are typically on the front of the body. They're over bony prominences, such as the forehead, elbows, knees, and shins. Common presenting scenarios are infants with bruises, vomiting without diarrhea, apparent life-threatening event known as an alti, sudden increase in head circumference, occult or hidden fractures or incidental findings where children are having x-rays for another reason but healing fractures are seen, and developmental delays. The severity of the symptoms can vary by the severity of the brain injury. Sometimes we see vomiting in children. Sometimes we see irritability or lethargy, difficult to arouse. We sometimes can see unusual sleepiness, sluggishness, or seeming spaced out. Now those four things, we may see them and attribute the uh, reason or the cause for those to other things other than uh, perhaps injury to the brain. But when we see the, the, the last three, the seizures, breathing difficulty, gasping respiration, stopping um, breathing, or when the heart rate slows or we see cardiac arrest, those three we typically will see the caregiver uh, seek medical care for those, mostly in an emergent type setting. The medical evaluation. A head CT looking for subdural bleeding and brain swelling becomes the cornerstone of the medical evaluation. We also would be looking at the skeletal survey, which is a series of x-rays numbering around 21 to look for fractures, and note a follow-up skeletal survey in 10 to 12 days is necessary in children under the age of two. We would look for an eye exam to look for retinal hemorrhage 
or bleeding in the back of the eye. Trauma and bleeding labs would be done to screen for signs of internal injury or bleeding disorder. An MRI of the brain and spinal cord would be done if the CT is abnormal because MRIs can demonstrate subtle brain injury that CTs sometimes will miss. And then photography of all visual injuries and call DCBS uh, immediately. Outcomes. The death rate for victims of pediatric abusive head trauma is approximately 20 to 30 percent. The disability rate among that 70 to 80 percent that do survive is about 90 percent. So there are very few children that are not affected by pediatric abusive head trauma. Disabilities for those that do survive include learning disabilities, emotional and behavioral issues, speech, language delays, vision, hearing, and we're even now finding that there are sometimes growth problems because during the shaking event, the pituitary gland is injured, then that is the gland that deals with growth issues. The severity of disability can range from very mild or subtle to very, very severe. Research is ongoing regarding the subtle brain changes that occur after pediatric abusive head trauma, and we still do not know the full spectrum of disabilities that can and do occur. When accepting an infant into care who has been a victim of trauma, request some time with the infant in the hospital prior to discharge in order to receive adequate training or information about the child's ongoing needs. Follow-up. Establish a medical home for these children. Monitor closely for developmental issues, emotional, behavioral issues, especially attachment problems, hormone problems, learning disabilities, and also if there are other siblings that might have witnessed the violence, make sure that any needs they have may be addressed through ongoing therapy or counseling. bit more about the medical home. Although you want to establish a medical home, you also want to have the subspecialists that are needed to provide the specialty care that this child will need. Subspecialists may include neurology, neurosurgery, ophthalmology, orthopedics, endocrine, physical medicine, rehab, along with speech, and OT and PT. Make sure that your medical home is aware of all of these subspecialties and that they serve as an individual to coordinate all of the subspecialties that are needed. Triggering situations. As we have said previously in the training, a crying infant is the number one trigger but there are also other things that can trigger the situation. A child's misbehavior, and this may result from parents not understanding child development and knowing how an infant um, should be behaving at a certain age. Arguments and family conflict can put the child at the center of a violent situation. The unsuccessful toilet training is another trigger. Many times parents attempt to toilet train the infant far too early before the child is developmentally ready and the unsuccessful uh, ability to toilet train creates situations uh, where the 
uh, caregiver becomes very angry. Parental stresses outside the home that can be brought into the house and taken out on the infant and discipline gone awry. Family factors that affect pediatric abusive head trauma. Domestic and fi family violence, any home where there is family violence is a, a situation that increases the um, risk factor of a child uh, coming into a violent situation. Single parent homes where one caregiver has the total responsibility of the infant can become very stressful. Unemployment, financial stressors, these can lead to increased stress in the caregiver. Isolation is a situation where there is, there's no one to help uh, share the, the stress, share the responsibility with the caregiver. Poverty and limited resources. Anytime there are limited resources, there is increased stress in the environment. And then animal abuse. We have, we know through studies and through statistics that there is a correlation between animal abuse and child abuse and domestic violence on uh, partners. Caregiver characteristics. We see parents with substance abuse issues, mental illness, low self-esteem, poor impulse control, caregivers that were abused as a child, teenage parents, unrealistic expectation of a child's behavior. That recognition to us that a caregiver has unrealistic expectations of a child may provide an opportunity for early intervention. So we need to be very dil diligent about watching for that. Immature parenting, poor coping skills, criminal history, CPS and prior removals, and caregivers abused as children. Child characteristics. When we are looking at the characteristics of the children that are at highest risk for pediatric abusive head trauma, we're looking at children birth to three years of age. We're looking at the drug affected, substance affected children that have a, a lot of issues with soothing, with feeding, sometimes lots of medical issues going on as well, very difficult to care for infants. We look at premature birth infants, long NICU stays, and even infants where there are multiples, uh, twins or triplets. These are all give rise to increased stress for the caregiver. Infants who are colicky uh, are difficult to care for. Infants with physical disabilities. Infants with developmental disabilities increase the stress for the caregiver. Um, infants with chronic illnesses, emotional, behavioral difficulties. Unwanted child, that is very different than an unplanned child. An unwanted child is a child that one of the parents uh, did not want. And as a result, any child that is in the care of uh, someone who does not want them, uh, it increases their risk for harm. Result of infertility, a uh, long-awaited child, that is happens when a uh, individual has wanted a child and for so long couldn't have it, then does have a child. Uh, the fantasy world that they have many times created isn't real and therefore then they see the, 
the real world where the baby is getting them up at night, crying, all kinds of issues. And yet, because they have wanted the child for so long, they are embarrassed to ask for help. Kentucky Fatality Risk Factors. The top four risk factors for fatal abusive injury among adult caregivers in the home include substance abuse, family violence, mental health issues, and cognitive disabilities. Case Review. A four-month-old baby boy presents for well child exam and is noticed to have two fingertip size bruises on each thigh. The parents explain that they came from a diaper change when the child was squirming. Social history offers no red flags. The doctor has seen the older sibling for the past two years. Unfortunately, this pediatrician didn't recognize the significance of bruising in infants. One week later, the child was brought to the emergency department unresponsive and having seizures. He was found to have bilateral subdural hematomas and 13 broken bones inflicted by dad who was tearful and outraged when told that someone had harmed his son. In looking at the pediatrician's records, the pediatrician had described the family as very nice, no concerns. Under social history, the physician documented family appropriate. The lessons learned, bruising in babies is not normal. Maltreatment can and does occur in nice families. The absence of risk factors is not the same as the absence of risk. Who are we most likely to overlook? Well, Caucasian families intact families, families that have both a mother and a father in the home, middle-class, well-educated parents, families perceived to be similar to our own, very young infants may have normal neuro exams, and infants with nonspecific symptoms only. Prevention, what can I do? Make a report to DCBS when you suspect abuse. Document any signs or symptoms you see. Take pictures of the injuries, remember Bruises change very quickly, so any bruising that you see, take pictures immediately. Document any information you receive from uh, a caregiver when you have suspicions. Document observations of the parent or the caregiver's reactions to concerns and interactions with the child. Help parents understand it's okay for a baby to cry. That's how they communicate. Help parents understand it's normal to feel frustrated by a crying baby, and it's okay to take a break and ask for help. Become a resource for these parents who may feel frustrated and need relief or support. Share tips with parents on how to soothe infants. Share tips with parents on how to take care of themselves. Tell parents about the 1-800-CHILDREN number. It is a resource to help parents who are struggling to find information uh, regarding child care. 
Talk openly with the children in your home about the dangers of shaking a child. Tools for soothing a crying baby. Try to meet the baby's immediate needs, such as feeding them, changing them, making sure the temperature is okay, etc. Those types of things. Pay attention to noise and lighting in the environment and try to change a location if a baby's not soothing. Check the baby for signs of illness or injury and call the baby's doctor if you've got any concerns. Rock, walk, or dance with the baby. Walk the baby in a stroller or take the baby for a drive in the car seat. Shush in the baby's ear or turn the vacuum cleaner on. Place a white noise machine near the child. Check to make sure the clothing isn't too tight, that the fingers or toes aren't bent or caught. Make sure that nothing is poking the baby. Place the baby on their back in a safe sleeping environment, which is a crib without padding, toys, stuffed animals, or pillows. Close the door, turn on the TV or the radio, and check on the baby every 10 to 15 minutes. Remember, crying will not hurt the baby. If you feel frustrated or angry, take a break. Count to 10. Call a friend or a support person. Tools for soothing yourself. Recognize that babies cry and they usually cry more from two to eight weeks of age. Rest. Sleep when the baby sleeps. Give yourself permission to make sleep and your baby your first priorities. Give yourself permission to be frustrated. Having a baby is hard work. Take a deep breath. Count to 5, 10, or 20. Ask for help. Get a sitter. Ask a family member or friend to watch the baby. Do something you enjoy. Walk, hike, read a book, take a bath. Call a friend. Talk with other new parents about being a new parent. When feeling frustrated, place the baby on its back in a crib and go to another room. Check on that baby every five to 10 minutes to give yourself time to calm down. Abusive head trauma prevention strategies. Home visitation, every child succeeds. The Department for Public Health has the HANDS program in all 120 counties of the state. In hospital parenting training is available, and then there's pre and postnatal education. Prevention models. These are some examples of prevention models that are available today. The Happiest Baby Model by Dr. Harvey Karp talks about multiple soothing techniques. The Period of Purple Crying focuses on walking away when frustrated. A portrait of a Promise provides education for parents and caregivers during the birth hospitalization. It teaches the caregivers about the dangers of shaking, and it asks parents to actually sign a commitment statement that says they will not shake their baby. It also offers many soothing techniques including permission to walk away. Key prevention message, education about the crying infant. We need to educate that crying is normal in infancy. It's the way they communicate. Provide specific tools for soothing a crying infant including permission to place the infant in a safe place and walk away and take a break. The take home message for this training is that education of caregivers regarding techniques of soothing an infant and the dangers of shaking can be an effective prevention tool. Experience tells us that we often fail to recognize 
these early warning signs and we miss opportunities to intervene and prevent further harm to these abused children. Contrary to popular belief, abusive head trauma is rarely a one-time event. It is more often the accumulation of an ongoing escalation of violence against the child. And non-offending caregivers are often unaware of the abuse. Further research into effective prevention techniques is needed. And until then, recognition of early warning signs is crucial. Here are some additional resources. Please contact the Kentucky Abuse Hotline at 1-877-KENTUCKY-SAFE-1 if you suspect that a child has been abused or neglected. Thank you for your attention.